The Jewish Channel's Week in Review. The bus bombing in Bulgaria. Bob Costas keeping silent to remember lost Israeli athletes. And this young woman and her surprising website want to go to the state senate. It's the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Five Israelis were killed and 30 wounded last week after a suicide bomber attacked their tour bus while they were vacationing in Bulgaria. The Bulgarian bus driver was also killed. The five who died and were subsequently flown to Israel for burial were four men in their 20s, Amir Menashe, Itzik Kolengi, Maor Harush, and Elior Pries. The one woman who was killed, Kochava Shriki, had just become pregnant after years of fertility treatments. Among the injured were an 11-year-old child and two other pregnant women. The Bulgarian bus driver who was killed was 36-year-old Mustafa Kiosev. While news reports have suggested suspects over the past week, it seems clear as we go to air that authorities have not identified a specific suspect. Bulgarian authorities have said that the suspect had a fake driver's license from Michigan and that the attacker can be seen on security camera footage near the bus in the hour before the explosion, a white male with long hair wearing glasses. Israeli officials immediately pointed to Iran and Hezbollah as the sources of the attack. Various media reports have cited anonymous American and Bulgarian officials making the same claim. Iran denied responsibility. The bus bombing comes after a series of attacks or attempted attacks on Israelis around the globe in recent months, all of which Israel has suggested were launched by Iran. They were listed in a statement from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu as Thailand, India, Georgia, Kenya, Cyprus and other places. Meanwhile, an effort to memorialize 11 Israelis who died 40 years ago as a result of terrorism is gaining new steam. The famous kidnapping and killing of Israelis at the Munich Olympics of 1972 by the terrorist group Black September is something that the Israeli government has said it would like to see memorialized with a moment of silence at the Olympic Games in London this summer, recognizing the 40th anniversary. Families of the victims have previously pushed for a moment of silence at every prior Olympic Games, but the call for a memorial this year seems to have caught on particularly well due to social media and the 40th anniversary. The International Olympic Committee has said it will not hold a moment of silence, but the vast majority of those watching the Olympics may well get one anyway. NBC sportscaster Bob Costas has said he'll make his own moment of silence live on the air during the opening ceremonies. In an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, Costas called the decision by the IOC not to hold the moment of silence, quote, baffling, and declared that he will note the IOC's denial of the request and then say on the air, quote, Many people find that denial more than puzzling, but insensitive. Here's a minute of silence right now. Earlier this week, the president of the IOC did hold a moment of silence for an audience of 100 in the Olympic Village where athletes reside. The issue has also become political as first President Obama and then Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney called for the IOC to hold the moment of silence. Romney had been chief executive of the 2002 Olympic Games in Salt Lake City, which was the 30th anniversary of the attacks, and did not at that time support the call for a memorial. Speaking of political divides, there's a race for state senate in Brooklyn that's caught a lot of attention after the young female Orthodox Jewish candidate launched a website that surprised a great many political observers. Meredith Gansman reports. My website, just because it's not red, white, and blue doesn't mean it's not substantive. You know, pink is my favorite color. And I'm sorry, it's time to bring pink to the table and, you know, bring in that energy that I have and channel it all into my website which is no less substantive to any of the other senators' websites in the 50 states that I've been going on from Wyoming to, you know, Colorado, and, you know, basically, they put me to sleep. Mindy Meyer has been waking up the national political scene with her glamorous website. It's pink, it's shiny, it has pop music, and a leopard print diva headline. It features photos of the candidate dressed up as the heroine of the popular book series and movie The Hunger Games to send a message that poverty and unemployment are a priority. Much of her approach to politics is inspired by Elle Woods, the fictional heroine of the film Legally Blonde. I feel comfortable using legal jargon in everyday life. I object. She showed me you could take pink to the most highfalutin legal institution of Harvard. Why can't I bring it to the Senate? Meyer's website became the toast of the political press after New York Beat reporter Ozzie Pybra linked it on Twitter with the message, yes, this is a real campaign site. From there, it went to The Observer and Politico and, well, 
everywhere. For a young candidate, it's been a long road to political prominence. Growing up in the orthodox enclave of Brooklyn's Flatbush neighborhood, Myers was also inspired by former New York mayor Rudy Giuliani, who she invited to her bat mitzvah. And on a school trip to Washington, D.C., she hoped to meet former President George W. Bush. So I made a few calls to the White House and, you know, I inquired, I'm like, oh, is George there? They're like, you mean the president? And they kind of just like thought I was some cute little girl. And in high school at Park Slope Yeshiva, she was on the debate team. We, I believe, argued a few political debates. But while carpooling to Toro Law School, her now campaign manager, Isaac Steyerman, had an idea. He mentioned, Mindy, why don't you consider running for something for public office? And, you know, I was considering, you know, maybe city council. Um, as it turns out, this year, you know, is senatorial elections. I said, why not just take it to the top? I'll run for senator. Go big or go home. Go, exactly. Let's, you know, sky's the limit. Let's just run for senate. I always thought that I would use my law degree into a segue into the political arena, but I figured, why wait till I'm done law school? Like, I could do it now. The 22-year-old has only one year of law school under her belt, but she's running as a Republican for the Senate seat held by 10-year incumbent Kevin Parker. However, she sees her relative lack of experience as an asset. There's no experience in corruption, so that's how I feel about that aspect of it. And that youthful approach extends to campaign strategy as well. Behind me is Mindy Meyer's campaign office. And unlike most, there are no flyers outlining her platform. There are no posters with her face splashed across it. But that's just how she and her campaign manager want it. Our campaign strategy is not necessarily printing flyers, throwing them about the streets. Again, we definitely are going to print campaign signs towards the election to put them around. However, flyers, we're really going to the internet for that, really going to the media, to social media sites, interacting with our voters in, on an individual basis, talking to them, answering their questions. We Mindy's hoping her style will attract young constituents to her platform, which, guided by her religious values, focuses on such issues as poverty and unemployment. I understand that my um, opponent had a career fair recently on you know, employment and jobs, and I just feel, feel like why not start with the younger population, you know, in the summer months when people are not really doing anything, they should start building up their resumes. We should allocate more government spending into like the youth corps programs. And this way, you know, they could start working on building up the resumes now so that in the future, you know, they won't have to have career fears or job fears. But there's one issue on which she's likely running against trends for young women, that of abortion. While her website emphasizes the notion of choices in relation to pregnancy, she's not actually pro-choice. I'm definitely pro-life, and I just meant by choices is that if a woman is faced in a situation where she has an unplanned pregnancy, I just feel there are choices that she can make without committing murder. I'm saying there are, there are many different things a woman can do for different classes, there's an option for everyone. If you're some highfalutin attorney and you can't manage your child into your schedule, then you could hire a nanny. If you don't have the means or the family to take care of your child, even if it was an unexpected or unplanned pregnancy, there are other families out there that would be happy to provide your children with what you cannot provide them with, and you could give them up for adoption. I just, I, what I meant by pro-choice is that a woman has many options nowadays. And a woman can multitask and, you know, I just feel like abortion's not an answer. So does Meyer have a good chance of winning? Veteran Democratic political strategist Hank Scheinkopf doesn't think so. Uh, could an Orthodox Jew and could a woman win a race in that district as a Republican? Not likely. Why? Democrat, overwhelming Democrat registration. Um, and if she did, it would be, certainly be a revolution. Um, but it's good to have campaigns, and it's good for people who are different to run for public office. And Republican strategist Jonathan Greenspun has some advice for the young candidate. And what you got to do is you got to put away the pink, and you got to put away the makeup and the Photoshop, and you got to hit the streets running. Because right now, the message she's sending is Barbie goes to the Senate, and that's just not a message that's going to sustain her in this district long term. Incumbent Kevin Parker hasn't expressed a great amount of concern about the competition he faces from Meyer, but he did say that all the attention paid to her website means he'll need to focus on upgrading his own website. 
But Meyer has a message for Parker. He won't be beaten on website design. So listen, Kevin, um, honestly, you are getting a little nervous. I know that because the comment you made, I need to up my game with the website. Like, you want to have competition on a website? Focus on your constituents while you are a senator. That's first of all. But if you want to go there, I could take it to the next level. You want to see a cooler, campaign, a cooler website? Please, I'll show you a cooler website. Um, also, the most that he could bash me about is that, you know, about my pink. And with the pink website as a rallying cry, Meyer assures me that she's in it for the long haul. Because that's not what it's about. I think I can take this election till mm -hmm. the end, and I will. One can only wonder what the end will mean for the future of campaign website design. In Brooklyn for the Jewish Channel, I'm Meredith Gansman. Thank you, Meredith. Christian Needham contributed to that report as well. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 291, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and now on Comcast Cable in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.